This lecture is on AC steady state analysis of circuits. Let's say I have a linear circuit excited by an AC steady state independent sources. Uh, for example, I have a current source cosine omega t plus theta. I'm sorry, a voltage source and a current source of IS cosine omega t plus phi. And what we're going to assume is we're going to assume that these sources have been on, turned on for a sufficiently long amount of time that any time constants uh, in the network, that the time is greater than five of those time constants that we're, we've reached the steady state. So there's no more switched transients in the circuit response, but now everything's oscillating periodically with the sinusoidal uh, excitations of the sources with radial frequency omega. If we do that, then we can correctly assume that all voltages and currents in the circuit will also be <clears throat> oscillating with the same period of um, <clears throat> with frequency omega. So you get 2 pi over big T, where T is the um, period of the, of the uh, oscillating source. And as a result, we found uh, last time that we can assume an e to the j omega t time dependence uh, for all of our sources. And for all node voltage is a branch of currents. And by linearity, then, if we calculated these um, uh, voltages or currents with this e to the j omega t dependence, we could apply, simply apply Euler's law to recover the time domain values. So with this, we found that we can convert these periodic um, sinusoidally varying sources into what we call a phasor form. That is, if Vs of t is, has a magnitude or a peak value, a peak voltage Vs times cosine omega t plus theta, I can rewrite this as the real part of the peak voltage Vs times the e to the j theta, e to the j omega t. Okay, so the product of these two exponentials would add the argument, so I'd have an e to the j quantity theta plus omega t. The real part of that would just be then Vs times cosine omega t plus theta by Euler's law. And we can similarly express my current source in the same way. What I realize is I can take the magnitude and phase of this term extract it from the time dependence, and we call that the phasor current, which has a magnitude of Is and a phase of phi. And I can rewrite Vs, my voltage source, in terms of a phasor Vs magnitude, e to the j theta, which is a phase theta, times e to the j omega t. And if I ever want to revert from the phasor main back to the time domain, then I can take the real part of the phasor times e to the j omega t and recover then its magnitude or peak voltage Vs times cosine omega t plus its phase theta and similar for the current. Okay. So this allows me to work in the, in the complex frequency domain, e to the j omega t, or the phasor domain, where I can assume phasor voltages for my voltages and currents. I'm sorry, phas phasors for my voltage and currents which are assumed to be weighted by e to the j omega t. And I can always resort, return back to the time domain by taking the real, multiplying the phasor by e to the j omega t and taking the real part of that. So what we found that is in doing so, we can look at uh, impedance relationships of resistors, capacitors, and inductors. That is Ohm's law relationship of a resistor is that V equals IR, or I can define what we call the complex impedance, Z, to be the ratio of the voltage across that resistor branch divided by its current, which is purely real, because its value is R plus some J zero, right? This is a zero measuring term. So therefore, the ratio of V over I over across the resistor has to be purely real, and its ratio is the resistance of that branch. For a capacitor, because my VI relationship for capacitors, the current of the capacitor is C dV by dt. I can write my voltage as my phasor V times E to the j omega t. Therefore, the derivative just becomes a product with j omega. So I can write that as, as my phasor current equals the product of j omega c, the algebraic product of the phasor Vc times E to the j omega t. Of course, E to the j omega t is cancel on both sides of the equation. So I can look at the ratio of the phasor voltage to the phasor current of a capacitor, which is the impedance of the capacitor is one over J omega C, okay? 
So I said the impedance of a capacitor, that is the voltage, the phasor voltage across the capacitor ratio to the phasor current is equal to one over J omega, where omega is the radial frequency of my sources, times the capacitance C. Similar for the inductor, my VI relationship is V equals L di by dt. Again, I can write my current as a phasor times e to the j omega t time dependence, which just becomes an algebraic product of j omega l times the phasor current times e to the j omega t. Again, e to the j omega t's cancel on both sides of this equation. So therefore, I have I can use this to say that the ratio of the phasor voltage to the phasor current is simply j omega l. That is, that I have an impedance, an effective impedance of an inductance, which would guarantees that the ratio of the voltage drop across, the phasor voltage drop across an inductor to the phasor current flowing through it is equal to impedance J omega L, okay? Both the impedance of a capacitor and inductor are purely imaginary, okay? Since the capacitor is the impedance of minus J over omega C, it's purely imaginary. It has a, a zero real part. And the impedance of an inductor is also purely imaginary. Later on, we're gonna find out that this makes sense because these are stored energy elements and the react or the, the, the imaginary part of an impedance is related to, will be related to the energy stored or the average energy stored, we'll find out. Okay, now similar when we're studying resistances, we have the reciprocal of a resistance we call the conductance. And then when I'm working with impedances, branch impedances in AC steady state, we define the reciprocal of the impedance to be the admittance. That is, the admittance is the ratio of the phasor current to the phasor voltage. So therefore, the admittance of a resistor, which is one over Z, or I over V, is equal to G, or one over R. So a resistor has a purely real admittance, which is just the conductance of that branch, or one over the resistance. For, for a capacitor, the admittance, again, is one over Z, or I over V, which is then equal to one over one over J omega C, which is equal to just J omega C. So the admittance of a capacitor is purely imaginary, it's positive imaginary, and it's just J omega C. And that is the ratio of the current of the capacitor to the phasor voltage across the capacitor. And the admittance of an inductor, Y is equal to one over Z of the inductor, or the phasor current divided by the phasor voltage is equal to one over J omega L. So the emittance of an inductor is purely imaginary, it's negative imaginary, and it's gonna be minus J over omega L, okay? So the emittances of capacitors and inductors are purely imaginary, the emittance of resistors is purely real. These all have the units of Siemens, and it's just the reciprocal of the impedance. So, in the AC steady state analyses, we'll be talking about branch impedances, not branch resistances, but branch impedances, which can be a combination of real and imaginary parts due to both reactive and resistive elements. So when I have an impedance, it can be complex when I start combining resistances and reactances, or resistances, capacitors, or inductors. And the net, you know, some net impedance can be a real part. R, which we call the resistance of that impedance, plus Jx, where X is what we call the imaginary part of the impedance, or the reactance. So we refer to R plus Jx as a complex impedance, where R is the resistance of units arms, X is the reactance in units ohms. So for example, for an inductor where the impedance is J omega L, I have an R of zero and a reactance of J omega. For a capacitor, I have a zero resistance, but I have a reactance of minus one over omega C. Okay. The reciprocal of that is the emittance, so I can define a complex emittance, uh, where I have, oops, that should be I equals V times Y, my emittance, where Y has a real part, which we call G, the conductance, which has units of Siemens, and the imaginary part we call B, and B is referred to as the susceptance, and we have has also the units of Siemens, of course. So for a resistor has a, a purely real admittance of G, which is one of R. A capacitor has a purely imaginary admittance, which is positive uh, omega C, susceptance. And the admittance of an inductor is negative 
imaginary, which is minus one over omega L, is the susceptance of an inductor with a zero conductance for an ideal inductor. Okay. So we'll be working with complex impedances and admittances in the easy steady state. All right. So let's look at some other properties. I could have series impedances. Let's say I have three series impedances, a capacitor, an induct uh, inductor, and a resistor, okay, with minus 5J ohms um, impedance for capacitor, 4 ohm uh, impedance resistor, and a 2J ohm impedance inductor. Of course, it should be positive impedance inductor. I'm sorry, positive reactance and negative reactance uh, capacitor. So I have a net voltage across these three series branches, Vs. I have a current through it, Is. And let's say V1 is a voltage drop across the capacitor, V2 across the resistor, V3 across the inductor. Well, if I know Vs, I can find Is. How? I can just simply apply first KVL. That is, by KVL, I must have that the sum of these voltages, if I go around a loop, minus Vs plus V1 plus V2 plus V3 must sum to zero. Right, I did a closed loop here. Vs minus Vs plus V1 plus V2 plus V3 equals zero. Um, or I can write that as Vs equals V1 plus V2 plus V3. But I can write V1 to be the current Is times the impedance minus J5 ohms with the capacitor plus V2 is Is times the resistance, 4 ohms. Plus V3 is Is times the um, reactants to J ohms of the inductor. They all share a common current because they are in series. Therefore, I can factor out the current, and what I see is that series impedances add. So these series impedances add. The real parts add, and the imaginary parts add. So my net branch, or my net series impedance is 4 minus 3J ohms. And I can, if I know Vs, I can then find Is by saying Is equals Vs over the net series impedance, Vs over 4 minus 3j ohms. Okay. So that would, KVL applies in the AC steady state. So L, impedances are in series, means they share the same current, which means those series impedances add. Okay, so in general, series impedances add. Well, we also have voltage division. Why? Well, let's look at the voltage across the inductor. I want to find V3. Well, V3 is just 2J ohms times Is. But Is is equal to Vs over 4 minus 3J, or Vs over the total series impedance. So therefore, I have voltage division. V3 is equal to Vs, the series impedance across all the series branches, times the impedance of the third branch, 2J ohms, divided by the net series impedance, 4 minus 3J ohms. Okay, that would give me the voltage across the capacitor, that ratio times Vs. So in series impedances, we can apply voltage division as well. So in general, the voltage across the ith branch is equal to the net voltage across all the series branches times the ith impedance divided by the sum of the series impedances. Well, let's look at parallel admittances. Okay. So here I have parallel branches. So let's put these three uh, branches in parallel instead of series. So I have a parallel, I have a current, I'm sorry, IP flowing into this common node. Okay, this is my top node of the parallel branches. This is my bottom node. I have a voltage VP across these three parallel branches. The current splits, I1, I2, I3. Okay. Or I can write this in terms of emittances. That is 1 over minus 5J equals 0.2J. Try it yourself. That's one-fifth times one over minus j. One over minus j is just equal to j. When I multiply top and bottom, I, it's conjugate, it's going to be j. Okay, so I can write minus 5j is 0.2j. One-fourth semen is 0.25 siemens. And one over 2j ohms of the inductor gives me minus point, a half j siemens. Okay. So these are the three admittances. This is my y1, y2, y3, okay? All right, so I have three parallel admittances which share the same voltage. Because they share the same voltage, I know they're in parallel. All right, so if I know VP, can I find IP? Well, the answer is yes, but I must first apply KCL. Well, KCL still applies, that is, that I look at the current flowing into the node IP must be equal to the currents flowing out, I1 
plus I2 plus I3, right? But if I know VP, then I can write I1 to be VP times the admittance 0.2J Siemens. So this is I1 plus I2 is VP times the admittance 0.25 Siemens of the resistor plus branch 3 is VP times minus 0.5J Siemens, which is the admittance of the inductor. I can factor out the common VP. And what happens? If I factor that out, I see that the three parallel admittances add. So I add the real parts and imaginary parts, and I get IP is equal to VP times net parallel admittance, which is the sum of the three admittances, which is 0.25 minus 0.3J. Okay. So this gives me my net parallel admittances, which is the sum of the three admittances, Y1 plus Y2 plus Y3 which is equal to the net parallel conductance plus the susceptance. So in general, parallel admittances add, or the reciprocal of that is that parallel impedances add inversely. That is, I can take the one over ZP to get, a one over YP to get ZP, one over Y1, a Z1 gives me Y1 and so forth. So I can also say that parallel admittances add, parallel impedances add inversely or parallel admittances add. Of course, since they're parallel, the currents divide. How do they divide? Well, based on the emittance. Let's prove that. Okay, so I can calculate from the above equation, VP is IP um, divided by point, the net parallel emittance. And if I want to find, say, the current through the third branch, that's equal to the admittance of the third branch times VP, which is minus 0.5J Siemens times um, yeah, VP, which is IP over the net parallel admittance. Okay, so this is my VP, is IP over the net parallel admittance, All right? So therefore, I can rewrite this in general as being I, the ith branch is equal to the current flowing into the node that splits the currents, IP, times the admittance of the ith branch over the sum of the parallel admittances. The ratio of the ith mittens to the sum of the parallel mittens times the current flowing in gives me the current on the ith branch. Or I can write that in terms of the impedances by writing the admittance of the reciprocal of the impedance. Okay. So we have current division and voltage division for AC steady state impedances. Okay. All right, so with all this said, this gives us enough tools now to proceed to analyze any general circuit, given our knowledge of it, uh, circuit analysis, of a linear network containing R's, L's, and C's and some independent sources. How do we solve this? Well, first of all, all of our sources have to have the same frequency omega. If they do not, then I have to apply superposition, apply one, and solve for one at a time, because I can only have one frequency omega exciting my circuit. Therefore, that omega is common of all branches and, and nodes in the network. Of course, I need to identify the value of omega. Here it's given to be omega. Next, I replace all my independent sources with their phasor values. So I write this as IS angle phi. This is VS angle theta. Next, I replace all RLs and Cs with their complex impedances. That is, our resistors are ours, and inductors have impedance J mega L, capacitors have impedances 1 over J mega C. At this point, I can apply KVL or KCL to all loops for KVL or all nodes of the circuit. That is, I can apply mesh analysis using KVL as I would normal, and I can apply a nodal analysis using KCL. So the key here is we're applying our analysis methods in exactly the same way as we did for the DC steady state analysis. That is, I can apply mesh analysis, nodal analysis, circuit reduction by adding parallel series, uh, Y delta conversion, so forth, of, uh, of uh, branch impedances or admittances. I, have, I can do source transformations. I can apply superposition, et cetera. All of my analysis methods apply. The only difference is now I'll be using impedances rather than in resistances. Once I set up my problem, solving it properly, I just solve for the phasor known voltages or the phasor branch currents. Okay. At that point, I can just apply Euler's law to recover any time domain known voltages to branch currents that I want to recover. It's that simple. 
Okay, so let's look at some examples. Let's say I want to do an AC steady state analysis of, um, of the circuit that I'm giving here. So it has one voltage source, two cosine, two T, and it has a quarter farad capacitor, two Henry inductor, and I have two resistors. And I want to find this current to the five ohm resistor, I, X, and T. First question I ask is, what is mega? Well, how do I identify mega? From my source. Source, two cosine, 2t. What's omega? You got it, the two. So my omega is two radians per second. Okay, I get that off my source, so now I know my omega. Next, how do I express my source as a phasor? Well, what is its magnitude? Two volts, it's phase, zero, because I can write this as plus zero degrees, right, or plus zero radians. So therefore my source is gonna be two angle zero. I write the source as just a two angle zero degrees. Next, I need to rewrite my branch and elements as impedances, right? So my capacitor, what's impedance? One over J omega C. What is omega? Two. My inductor, J omega L. What is omega? Two. What's L? Two Henry's. So it's J four ohms, all right? So I can write my capacitor as one over J omega C which is one over J times two radians per second times 0.25 farads, which is one over J 0.5, which is equal to minus two J ohms. My inductor is J omega L. I can write that as J times two radians per second times two Henry's is J four ohms. So now I write this as J four ohms for my inductor and I write my capacitor as minus two J ohms and I write my source as being um, two angle zero. And at this point, I would be ready to do my AC steady state analysis, okay? All right, and of course, my resistors remain unchanged, five ohms and two ohms. All right, so now I've redrawn my circuit and I need to find my IX and how am I gonna do that? Well, I, I can do a mesh analysis, right? I have two loops. I can do nodal analysis, I have one node, and I have one or two nodes, right? One reference node plus a node here, and this is the constrained node, which is two volts. Or I could just use circuit reduction. Well, let's just do circuit reduction. So at first I notice I can do a source transformation right here, right? So I get a series VZ source. So my source transformation is I can cre create this Tevnen source into a Norton. How? By taking the voltage divided by the impedance gives my current and this becomes, that's in parallel with the parallel impedance. So I can rewrite that as being two angle zero over minus two J, which gives me a plus one J amp source. And this is in parallel with the two J ohm capacitor. If I want to find IX, I see that these are in series. So this gives me a two plus four J series impedance, right? So that's one branch. These three branches are all in parallel this year. They're bound by the same nodes, right? So therefore I can use current division. So my current division, Ix, is going to be equal to one-fifth of a semen divided by the sum of one over minus j2 plus one-fifth plus one over two plus four j times one j amp. So here I've done this in MathCAD, so I have one j amp flowing in. I want the current along the, the five ohm uh, branch, which is one over five ohms admittance, so it's one-fifth of a semen plus one over minus two J plus one over one fifth plus one over two plus four J. This last branch, this gives you my current IX, which is 0 0.471 angle 45 degrees. I could also find it through this two plus four J branch by multiplying in the numerator of one over two plus four J. And that gives me 0.527 and angle minus 18.435 degrees. Um, from that, knowing Ix and Iy, I could also find my Is, now the source current from this Tebnet source, which is the sum of Ix plus Iy, right? And that gives me 0.85 angle, 11.31 degrees. Okay. Convert this back to time domain. Take Ix of T. Take the real part of the phasor Ix, which is 0.471 angle 45, e to the J2T. So I can write that by Euler's law then 0.471 cosine 2t e to the uh, plus 45 degrees. 
That's my trains in IX in the time domain. IS, the source current, is its magnitude 25, cosine 2t, plus 11.31 degrees. Okay? All right. So that concludes the solution uh, to this simple problem for the AC steady state. All right. I invite you to, I actually invite you to solve this different ways using mesh and nodal and see if you're recovering the same answers uh, just as exercises of learning how to do steady state solutions. Okay, let's look at another problem. Say I'm analyzing um, this circuit here as a voltage source. And here I'm already in the phasor domain. I had a, 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 a frequency, radial frequency of five ratings per second. Uh, I converted everything over um, to uh, uh, the phasor domain. So I have a minus five J ohm capacitance uh, resistance impedance, plus three J ohm uh, in inductive impedance. I have a two angle zero current source on the right, 12 angle 45 current source on the left, and a five ohm form resistor. And I wanna use mesh analysis to find the mesh current, okay? Just as an example. All right, so let's apply our mesh analysis. Let's review that, how do I do that? Well, first we identify the number of independent loops in the network. So how many independent loops do I have? Well, it's a 2D simple network. It's a number of holes, I have two. Next, we want to label our mesh currents indicating direction of current flow, okay? So I have two independent loops, so I have two currents. So I'll call this I1 and I2. I1 flows through all the branches in uh, mesh one. I2 flows through all the branches in mesh two. Since they share this common branch, I have I1 flowing down, I2 flowing up, and they superimpose over this branch. Next, we apply current constraints. That is, we constrain the mesh currents by any current sources in the network, independent or dependent. I have one current source. Well, since I2 is flowing down through this branch, I see that I2 must be equal to minus two angle zero amps, right? That's my current constraint. So that gives me one equation. All right, next. I have to express any dependent quantities by the mesh currents. Well, there's no dependent sources in that network, so I have nothing to do there. And finally, I apply KCL around all mesh loops that do not contain a current source, all right? So that should be KVL, sorry. Apply KVL around all mesh loops that do not contain a current source. So I do KVL, I can do, I cannot do it around I2. Why? Because I have a current source and I cannot predict the voltage across that current source. I can apply it around mesh one, why? Because I have no current sources. Okay? And I can predict the voltages across all these branch elements if I knew the branch, if I knew the mesh current. Finally, if I have uh, any super loops, that is I have any interior current sources, as I had any mesh loops sharing a current source, I have to superimpose those, those loops into a single loop, which we call a super loop, and apply a KBL around the super loop. Finally, this is guaranteed to give me N equations for my N unknowns, which is my N um, mesh currents. And I solve that N by N linear system equations for my N mesh currents. All right, so let's do that. So apply mesh analysis. So again, we have our current constraint. I2 is minus two amps. This is I2 is flowing down, my current flowing up. I2 is minus two amps. Then I do KBL around mesh one. Okay, so to KBL, I get a minus 12 angle 45 plus I15 plus I2, I'm sorry, plus I1 minus I2 times minus 5J ohms, sums to zero. Put the, the, the voltage source on the right hand side. So I get five I1 plus a minus 5J times I1 minus I2 equals 12 angle 45. All right. This gives my two equations for my two unknowns, so I can solve. Well, this is easy to solve because I can just plug in for I2 and I have an algebraic expression, which I can solve for I1. That is, I can move the um, minus 5J times minus I2 on the right-hand side, so it just gives me minus 5J I2 on the right. I add these two terms, I get five minus 5J I1 on the left. And now since I2 is minus two amps, I'll plug that in, and minus two times minus 5J gives me plus 10J divided by five minus 5J. And finally, this gives me 2.88 angle 110 angle uh, 0.3 degrees amps for I1. 
And so now I'm done solving for I1 and I2 for this uh, using mesh analysis. Okay, well, let's say I wanted to find the voltage across the capacitor. How would I do that? Well, I can find the net currents of this branch. If I'm going to put the high, assume it's plus minus this way for my VC. Then positive current flowing down is I1 minus I2 times minus 5J gives me that voltage. Okay. So I just plug in um, uh, I1 minus I2 times minus 5J. And this gives me um, 14.32 angle minus 20.344 degrees uh, volts for um, VC. Okay. All right. Again, you know, just like DC steady state analysis, I know the mesh currents, I can calculate any branch voltage that I want. So the only difference here is I have complex branch impedances instead of just real resistances, but the analysis is exactly the same as what we did with DC steady state. It just has this additional layer of complexity where we're dealing with complex impedances instead of resistances. Okay, so let's look at a third example. This third example, I want to do a nodal analysis, of course. And so let's do, let's study an op amp circuit where I have to use nodal analysis. Again, this is an AC steady state. I'm giving you a phasor source. So I'm already mapped into the phasor domain. I have a 12 angle zero voltage uh, source in the phasor domain. I have a capacitor in here with a minus J 10K ohms impedance. And I have three resistors, 10K ohms. 10 k ohms and 40 k ohms. I want to find the output phasor voltage. Okay, of course it's op amp circuit, I need to know nodal analysis. How do I apply nodal analysis? Well, we have our procedure, right? What do we do? We identify the net reference node. Boom, that's my reference node, it's ground. Label it, zero volts. Two, label all other reference nodes. Okay, so I have non-reference node here, Non-reference node here, a non-reference node here, non-reference node here, okay? All right, call this V0. Okay, a minute we do our voltage constraints, and here I have a Vn and a Vp for my cross my op amps. Now I have one, two, three, four node, non-reference nodes. Next, we apply our voltage constraints. We constrain all node voltages by voltage sources. Well here, since this voltage source, is, this node is constrained by this 12 volt angle zero source, which between that node and ground, I can just label this node voltage I know is 12 angle zero volts, okay? All right, so voltage constraint immediately tells me what that node voltage is. Now I have my op amp constraints. Op amp constraints say I must have zero amps flowing in, and I must have zero volts across the inputs of the op amp, which means that these the two the voltages of the negative and the positive terminals must be equal. Okay. So therefore, the negative and positive terminals share the same voltage. So this, both of these are at some potential, which I will call here VA, for example. All right. So both of these are the same potential, VA. And finally, I have V0. So I have how many unknowns? Two unknowns, V0 and VA. Okay, I start with four, how do I get down to two? Well, I had a voltage constraint due to the source and I had another voltage constraint because I had zero volts across the input. That's a second equation. And it constrains these to be the same, which now that gives me two equations, eliminated two of those unknowns. Now I have two more unknowns to solve for, V0 and VA. How do I solve for those? I apply KCL. Where do I apply KCL? Well, I have to apply KCL at all non-reference nodes, not connected to a voltage source, not connected to the output terminal of the op amp. Why? Because the output terminal of an op amp behaves like a voltage source. It is going to provide the voltage V0 at the output. Right? And of course, um, not directly connected to reference node. So where can I apply KCL? I cannot apply at this node because it's connected to a source. I cannot apply at this node because it's connected to the output of the op amp. I can apply it to the input, uh, this negative input terminal node, 
because it's not connected to reference, not connected to a source, and I can't apply it to the positive, the node connected to the positive terminal. So those will be my two nodes that I'm going to um, use for my KCL. Okay. So again, as I apply nodal analysis, I apply uh, my la I label my reference node as zero volts. I label my input currents as zero amps. Okay. Um, label the input nodes across the op amp as having zero volts, zero volts across here, right? For my op amp constraint, All right? And therefore, I can label these two nodes to be the same. So I'll label both of these as VA. Okay, this is V0, and by voltage constraint, this is 12 angle zero. Right? So therefore, I've, now I have um, um, all my nodes labeled, and I can go ahead and solve for this by beginning to solve my KCL. First, I have to always identify how many nodes I have. I have two. What are they? VA and V0. Two unknowns. Okay. Where can I apply my KCL? Again, even though V0 is unknown, I cannot apply KCL here. Why? Because it's connected to the output of the op amp. Cannot apply KCL there. Can't apply here. It's connected to a voltage node, a voltage uh, source. I can apply here at the input terminal. It's not connected to ground, not connected to the output. And I can apply at the positive or the non inverting terminal. Of the LP amp as well. Okay, so it's my two nodes that I can apply KCL to. All right, so let's go ahead and do KCL. So I'll look at node A. Node A is just VA minus zero over 10k ohms plus VA minus V0 by 40k ohms plus zero flowing in equals zero. That's my first equation. Second equation. Green node, VA minus 12 angle zero over 10 K ohms. It's current flowing to the left. VA minus zero over minus 10 J K ohms. Current flowing to the down. And current flowing in to the opposite of zero. And this sums to zero. This gives me my second equation. So I have two equations for two unknowns. From equation two, I can solve for VA. Okay. Just applying some algebra. All right, I put minus 12 angle zero over 10K over to the right, and VA over times 1 tenth plus one over minus 10, uh, J10, K ohms. Okay, this gives me VA uh, is equal to 12 angle zero times minus 10 JK over 10 uh, K ohms minus J10 K ohms. This gives me six minus six J volts or 8.485 angle minus 45 degrees is my VA. Okay, so from, from equation two, I solve for VA. Now I can plug that back into equation one. In equation one, then I put V0 over on the right-hand side. I get VA times 1 tenth plus 1 40th times, um, yeah, uh, equals V0 over 40 K ohms. So therefore, V0 equals 40 K ohms times 1 tenth K plus 1 40th K times VA. VA is 6 minus 6 J. Um, this just gives me 5 VA, so it's just 42.425 angle minus 45. Right? And that is my output. Okay? So my output becomes that capacitor has a magnitude gain of about 5. Actually, it's exactly 5. But it also has a phase shift of minus 45 degrees because of this capacitor. It's not just simply, uh, you know, this would be in a non-inverting form, but it's it's not a, a, a zero degree phase shift because this capacitor, it's a minus J45 degree phase shift, okay? All right, now the solution is complete. Okay, and that summarizes um, uh, this lecture on doing an AC steady state or it concludes, I should say, this lecture on an AC steady state analysis.